Hello, debaters of YouTube. Welcome to the new debate season 2021 to 22. This video is coming out a little bit late because, well, as usual, this is a one man show, but also especially because I just moved 12 time zones away, which is just as much of a hassle as it sounds, probably a lot more. Uh, so I'm newly vaccinated, severely jet lagged, but still confident that we can make this happen. Uh, the NSDA naming committee is in fact back on its game this month with a fire topic to start off the season. Although in truth, I'm just a sucker for any simple military topic. And here is your simple military topic. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, should substantially increase its defense commitments to the Baltic states. Before we begin with the topic analysis for today, uh, please subscribe if you're not already subbed. Uh, substantially increase your commitments to the like button and comment a fake NATO fact if you have one. So today we'll begin on background. What is NATO? What are the Baltic states? Why do we need more defense commitments or not for them? Uh, and then we'll go as usual just into general pro arguments, con arguments, followed by a very brief discussion of strategy as requested by all of you for each one. Now, last month I gave you a survey through my email list. I really appreciate everyone who filled out that survey. It was extremely helpful, actually. One of the major complaints was that these videos came out a little bit too late. Obviously, I haven't uh, improved on that here. But um, another complaint was that there wasn't enough analysis of the topics, enough analysis of the arguments, how to use them, etc. Uh, I would love to provide more for each argument. However, that would increase the length of the video, maybe double it, triple it. And uh, for the sake of brevity, which I feel like is much more important to you all, you know, keeping the video to 30, 40 minutes and having a good overview of everything, um, I'm going to stick with just a simple uh, presentation of the arguments rather than a deep analysis, just for the sake of your time, because a lot of you will be bored by um, overly analyzing maybe some simple arguments. So I'll leave the rest of it up to you. If you are confused about anything, if you need to do more research, that's, of course, your job as a debater. Okay. Let us begin, shall we? Uh, first on background, lots to talk about here. So, uh, the Baltic states compose three countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. They all border the, you guessed it, Baltic Sea. However, not all countries that border the Baltic Sea are uh, the Baltic states. In fact, the Baltic states, the name suggests only these three states. Um, all of the countries are small. They're all former Soviet countries, and once again, they all border the Baltic Sea, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Uh, all three countries joined NATO in 2004, which was fairly late, yes, fairly late um, for most countries. However, in 2004, March 29th, a number of other countries joined, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, and Slovenia. NATO shuffled seven different countries uh, into membership on that date. These three countries may be the most likely to be invaded by Russia uh, in terms of NATO countries. If Russia were to launch an invasion, these countries may m make the most sense. And we'll look at why later. Uh, the biggest reason is because they are the only former Soviet states to be admitted into NATO. So these were former USSR members um, before uh, 1991. So, yeah before the breakup of the USSR. Let's talk about NATO. I think most of you should be familiar with it, but a brief refresher. NATO is composed of the US, Canada, plus 28 European countries. It is essentially a military alliance. It's an alliance formed to protect each other. And um, from the, let's say, American or NATO perspective, the purpose of NATO is to um, counteract the threat of Russia, right? So once again, after World War II, during the Cold War, uh, the Soviet Union, Union was seen as a very large threat. Uh, stopping communism was a big goal of, of uh, the U.S. And um, Soviet expansionism was also countered through NATO. So uh, NATO is essentially a mutual defense uh, pact. That is Article 5. It says an attack on one is an attack on all. That means that if any country in NATO were to be attacked by um, Russia or any other country, right, attacked by China, attacked by Mexico... All of the other countries would need to come to their help um, by treaty, right? So if America's attacked, they have uh, 29 other countries that must come to their aid. If Lithuania is attacked, same thing. Of course, there's other things that NATO does, like political consultation, uh, promoting democratic values. But the main goal is really to guarantee the freedom and security of its members. 
of course, on the con side, we'll see from the Russian perspective, NATO might not be so innocent or might not be so good. Um, in fact, from the Russian perspective, NATO can be seen as an aggressor, right? For example, do you need 30 countries, including the world's major superpowers, to oppose Russia? Did you even need the same for the Soviet Union? Was the Soviet Union even a threat? Did NATO even need to exist? These are questions that the con team um, might very reasonably ask. Let's look at the geography of these three countries. So things to keep in mind, NATO, which we just talked about, which is not all of Europe, but many European countries, 28 of them, uh, plus US and Canada, Baltic Sea, which just talked about the Baltic countries, which is the focus of this topic, uh, Russia in generally, and specifically Kaliningrad, Russia, which is um, a very unique sort of geographical uh, enclave that we'll take a look at. So here's what it looks like sort of um, topographically. Here's with labels. Zooming in a little bit, here we have the Baltic Sea, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Um, Poland, Belarus may also come into this picture. Uh, Poland is also a NATO, uh, NATO member. Uh, Belarus is not, and in this fact, a much closer ally of Russia. You'll also notice that um, uh, both Belarus and Russia really are pressed against these uh, countries. So in terms of uh, some kind of a military... Um, spat any kind of an invasion or something less than an invasion. Uh, these countries are really very, very easy for Russia and its allies to access. Zooming in even farther, you'll see right below Lithuania, and I don't know if you can see my mouse actually, but right below Lithuania, um, there's this place, Kaliningrad. You can see this very small label in the uh, lower left-hand corner. And uh, this is part of Russia. So it's separated from mainland Russia, but it is, in fact, part of Russia. This is a main forward staging base for Russian missiles, troops, artillery, etc. Um, so, therefore, a huge threat to Lithuania, to Poland, which um, it sits right on top of. Uh, on the other hand, this is also a... a an area that NATO places huge concentration on uh, putting firepower nearby, uh, missiles and, and whatnot. And uh, so this could also be seen as NATO threatening Russia, Russia threatening NATO. That's really both happening. Um, in case you're wondering, the Baltic Sea does have 4.7 stars uh, out of five on Google Maps. You might be wondering what kind of comments would people have about an entire sea? Well, I'm so happy you asked. Here's some of my favorites. This sea smells like peas from Adam, Alan Frazier. Aki says, not good, very pirates. Harrison says, he drowned. R.I.P. Harrison. And Person says, he took his pet goldfish there for a walk. Haven't seen him since. Uncool. Here are some of the bad reviews of the Baltic Sea. Next, let, let's look at the uh, relationship between the Baltics and Russia. Obviously, these countries are very close, right? And like any countries that are very close, there's a large bleed over of, of language, of culture, um, of, of people, you know, of, of, of commerce, things like this. So, you know, if you look, look at any country, right, you look at, let's say, northern U.S. and its relationship with Canada, um, southern U.S., its relationship with Mexico, obviously a, a lot of very similar culture on either side of the border. Um, a lot of people in the southern U.S. speak Spanish, um, and a lot of shared history, of course. Um, you know, it's not just the fact that they're neighbors, but also that, for example, large parts of the U.S. used to be Mexico, right? And so um, it's the same kind of situation happening in the Baltic states and Russia, Russia. In terms of ethnic Russians, one quarter of Latvians and Estonians are actually ethnic Russian, which is a pretty... A large minority of people, right? And then five, something like 5% of Lithuanians, I got these facts from Wikipedia. Take them with a grain of salt, but the point stands that there's a lot of Russians in these countries, right? There's many, many more people, up to I think half or so, that even speak Russian that but aren't Russian, right? And many, many more that speak Russian maybe as a, as a second language. So Russia and the Russian language and the Russian culture is a huge influence on these countries, although they are their own distinct ethnic groups with their own languages. Um, they speak a Latvian language, Estonian lang language, Lithu Lithuanian language. And so these are certainly sort of separate um, separate ethnic groups and, and have their place as, as, as their own countries. However, given these ethnic uh, Russian minorities, this is a large uh, motivation or at least a big talking point for Putin and for Russia to say that um, they have some kind of a claim to the Baltics. Military budgets, it will not shock you that Russia has more money than these Baltic states. That will not be a surprise. So if you total the Baltic's military budgets, it's 1 24th of Russia's budget. 
Um, if you want to look at the size of the militaries, I don't know how many sort of standing troops Russia has, but Estonia has 7,000. 7,000. 7,000 professional personnel. Latvia has 6,500, even less, professional soldiers in their militaries. And this shows, of course, how tiny the countries are, but also how just overwhelmed they would be by any kind of a Russian show of force. Now, the countries do have more in terms of National Guard and, and reserves, but um, they just, they're just they very small countries with very few people to defend them. In terms of the threats coming from Russia, then this will be uh, very important to note for both teams, for pro on offense and for con on defense, that there's many, many threats that NATO could potentially buttress against, right? The most obvious is military. Um, uh, uh, military invasion is most of what the literature will talk about, most of what we're, we'll, we're going to talk about. Um, but there's also other things, misinformation, propaganda, capital, organized crime, political influence, um, a lot of other potential threats that Russia poses to the Baltics that NATO could be of assistance in um, increasing its defense, defense commitments about. I think defense commitments um, most likely should be defined as uh, military in nature, and I think that's what uh, the Khan team really needs to limit. Um, but you could really blow up this topic by talking about just defense generally about all of these different things. Okay, so let's yeah talk about how how exactly uh, NATO could defend uh, the Baltics. Already, NATO troops are stationed on bases in the Baltics. So um, each country has some hundreds or thousands of NATO troops uh, on a uh, rotational schedule that come in and out of the country, the troops themselves, but also on bases. They're on bases and they have um, armor, just meaning tanks, artillery, um, in the area. However, more missile defense could also be used as a way to um, repel a Russian invasion, right? Because obviously taking out key targets with missiles would be perhaps an early part of a war. And um, uh, Rus Russian uh, missile capabilities are, I don't have to tell you how incredible they are. And so missile defense could be another type of defense your case could focus on. Um, changing the nuclear posture. So uh, we talked about this this uh, mutual defense aspect of NATO, which is sort of the main purpose of NATO. Um, the United States, France, and the UK are all NATO members, and all of them have nuclear weapons. And there are uh, specific nukes that are sort of on loan, I believe, from the US uh, for NATO, for NATO's defense. Meaning, once again, if any of these countries were hit by a nuke, um, the, the response would be with NATO nukes, right? Um, however... Uh, it gets more complicated when we talk about um, tactical nukes. It's a s small nuclear weapons, right? And so if there was really a face-off face of troops on the battlefield, especially a lot of, um, a lot of weapons, a lot of tanks, a lot of uh, soldiers, uh, small tactical nuclear weapons could be used to gain an advantage. Of course, um, using any kind of a nuclear weapon has uh, uh, you know, the potential to spiral out of control. And so this... Um, this fact that, that Russia has tactical nukes prepared to use on the battlefield um, and that NATO, I believe, does not, uh, doesn't have really anything uh, uh, close to what Russia has in terms of tactical nukes, uh, could be a, an, an area of increasing defense. So changing the nuclear posture to, to prevent uh, Russians using nukes in the case of an invasion uh, could be another way to bolster defense. Um, cyber attacks are constant. Uh, by Russia to, well, all, anyone that they see as an enemy, but the Baltics are no exception, and so some kind of cyber defense could be um, another way that they could increase defense commitments. And then uh, propaganda defense, I honestly have no idea what this means. I just wrote it down on the Prezi. If this, uh, you know, sparks any inspiration from you, I hope you can run with it. All right, there's your background. I hope and pray that's all you need. If not, you may want to pause the video and do some Googling. Let's start with pro arguments. So, of course, pro is saying we do need to uh, increase defense commitments to the Baltic states. Uh, the biggest reason is because Russia is a threat. They want to invade the Baltics. And lastly, the Baltics are not prepared to defend themselves. And more importantly, NATO is also not prepared to defend themselves. However, there's one way that we can fend off a Russian invasion, and that is by increasing defense commitments. So to maintain the status quo, to... Uh, to prevent war, prevent escalation, prevent an invasion, we need to um, station troops there or 
otherwise increase defense commitments. Um, I just realized I've used the same picture twice. I am honestly appalled and sorry, but I'm 16 minutes in and I'm not going to stop. You can just keep staring at these guys. All right, so let's talk about the status quo uh, from the pro point of view. The pro says we need to increase defense commitments. So as it stands, NATO troops are merely symbolic. Yes, there are troops there, but they don't provide any real deterrence. If Russia wanted to invade, they would simply roll over these uh, troops. There would be nothing really to stop them. Uh, Russia is, of course, one of the most powerful militaries in the world, and to suggest that a few hundred or even a few thousand uh, troops without heavy armor uh, would be able to repel a Russian invasion is ridiculous. Uh, this is from Bidenchik. I'm sh I don't know how to pronounce Scandinavian names. This is a, I believe, a husband and wife team, by the way. So if you ever get married to someone, uh, don't, and you have a hard name, don't give them your name and then write papers together. Although I guess if you can pronounce one, you can pronounce both, right? So, uh, NATO troops are merely symbolic. They're not actually doing anything right now to keep Russia out. Russia could, in fact, take the Baltics in two days. That's Bender 15. Uh, I've seen uh, estimates up to three or four days, but nobody says that the Russia couldn't, in the status quo, easily take them over with literally no resistance. Um, literally no resistance, meaning not much resistance. Okay, the Baltic states are, in fact, quote, scared to death of Russia. So that's Schmidt 17, uh, and for good reason. So the people on the ground there, the politicians there, um, the actual people are are preparing for an invasion daily. Like, they, uh, this is sort of a constant looming threat over their heads. Uh, now, on the other hand, it has been a constant looming threat for a long time, and, and Russia has uh, never inched any closer to the Baltics. So um, perhaps their fear is unwarranted. Uh, and then you may say, okay, well, we have nukes, and if uh, Russia invades, then uh, you know NATO can perhaps use its nukes to deter Russia. PAC-21 says no. Na NATO nukes won't just uh, stop Russia, especially in terms of... Um, Tactical nukes, once again, I'm not really sure what NATO's capabilities are, in fact, in, in terms of uh, uh, tactical nukes, but uh, NATO says that that they, they wouldn't really stop Russia just because in terms of uh, nuclear escalation, Russia is way, way, way ahead of NATO. NATO has much more to lose than Russia does in terms of using nuclear weapons. Um, so uh, Russia knows this, right? And it's been war gamed out, and uh, these nukes won't provide a real deterrent. So status quo: uh, the troops that exist do very little, and they're very easy prey. Uh, the countries are very easy prey for Russia. Now, of course, the con side might argue that okay, this is all well and good, but does Russia actually want to take over the Baltics? This is a really an important point, right? If Russia doesn't actually pose any kind of a threat to the Baltics, there's no need to increase the defense commitments, right? I mean, the U.S. could easily take over uh, Portugal, right? If the U.S. wanted to fight a war with Portugal and invade, like, geez, probably they could do it, right? Does that mean that Portugal needs to defend itself? No, uh, the U.S. has no interest in taking over Portugal. That wouldn't be an issue, right? And so j just because uh, Russia could easily take over the Baltics, they could easily take over many countries, right? That doesn't mean that those countries need to be in constant fear of Russia. So this is the actual threat. 2014, uh, Russia invaded the Ukraine a uh, very strategic peninsula in the Black Sea called Crimea. I'm sure most of you know about this. This is Pfeiffer 19, uh, but many, many sources. And uh, this just goes to show that Russia really doesn't have any hangups uh, uh, over inventing, uh, over invading its neighbors, right? And uh, so, yeah, they they had much of the same kind of propaganda, much kind of same kind of rhetoric. Crimea is historically Russia's; it belongs to Russia. Uh, they didn't uh, formally declare war. They didn't have sort of, sort of a formal invasion, uh, but they were able to, in a very modern tactical sense take over Crimea, which they now own, although it's not recognized as uh, part of Russia by uh, most countries. In fact, Russia has taken incredible um, flack for this invasion. They have suffered tremendously in terms of, of sanctions, in terms of being uh, kicked out of the G8. So uh, it's not like they paid no price for Crimea. It's not like they got off scot-free, but they do still hold on to the peninsula. Uh, 2017 was the first time that Russia and the Russian and, Navy and, and Chinese Navy held drills in the Baltic, uh, in the Baltic Sea. That's Higgins 17, and so we see Russian and Chinese cooperation uh, even very, very far away from China. 
um, as another potential threat to the Baltics. Uh, 2020 uh, saw increased naval and air activity from Russia around the Baltic region. Uh, there I have two cards on first naval, second air. Uh, and another development in 2020, this is a little bit over the radar, uh, under the radar, no pun intended, as Harris 21 talks about from August 2020, uh, false flag, potential false flag operations from fake GPS ship data. So every data, every ship that's sailing uh, needs to, um, needs to transmit codes about where it's going, right? What, what's it, what its course is and uh, to identify the ship. And and so you can go and look at this data, right? To just make sure that you're not going to run into another ship or something to make sure ships aren't getting near your uh, shore if it's illegal. You can just go look at ship data. And uh, they, the Harris 21 found, I believe it was actually Harris who did the study. It, he could have just been reviewing another person's study. But that uh, much of this ship data, especially on military ships, has been faked recently. A couple Russian ships, but mostly uh, uh, NATO ships. So mostly US, mostly like UK. Uh, some of these ships coming very close to, to Russian waters. And Russia using this fake GPS coordinates to say um, that they're that NATO is, is pressuring them or that they're sort of disrespecting their territorial space. And so uh, we don't know for a fact that this false GPS data is coming from Russia, but we highly suspect it, it is. Even though there's a couple Russian ships who also had fake data, this is probably uh, doesn't really do anything to, to kill the theory that it's actually Russia doing this. But you, you see how, how this is one example. This is just one example how Russia could use uh, misinformation um, in order to justify some kind of an invasion. All right, lastly, uh, Putin recently has been emboldened by uh, Biden, who met with Putin, who sort of uh, has a military turn towards China rather than Russia, so saying Russia is not our biggest enemy, let's work with Russia now, um, and instead concentrate our sort of hostilities on China uh, by the recent uh, 2014 takeover of Crimea that we just mentioned, and lastly by the uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which will be finished very soon. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline is a gas pipeline from Russia into Europe that will give Russia even more control and sway over Russia uh, over the Europe's um, energy resources. That's Terhal 21. So here we have many many data points that point to. Um, potential Rus Russia aggression. It's not saying for sure that Russia wants to invade the Baltics, and if you found some cards, which I believe we do have, that actually say, yes, Russia does want to invade the Baltics, uh, that would make your case clearly much better. One other note on Putin is that Putin, as a dictator, is a bit of a wild card. Not that he's unpredictable per se. Uh, I think many people who analyze Putin's behavior... Uh, have a good grasp on what the guy's like and and what kind of advantages he might take situation uh, may, what kind of situations he might take advantage of uh, but still he's essentially one guy controlling the entire country right and so uh, different from let's say in the states where if Biden wanted to do something he does have some kind of limits on his power Putin doesn't seem to have any major political limits on his power and so even if there's not some direct immediate or obvious threat, Putin could do something that we don't expect. This is really possible having a dictator of a country. All right, so I'm going to have some purple bubbles here for some of the big arguments you're going to see, the answer to. So Pro says Russia invaded Crimea, Belarus is next, maybe uh, the Baltics are next. What would be the answer to Ukraine in terms of the Baltics? Very simply, Ukraine is not at all the Baltics. This is a quote from O'Hanlon21. The Baltic states have never been recognized by Washington as part of the USSR. It would be another thing entirely, and not a close call in terms of strategic wisdom, to include countries whose history and geography and people are so intertwined with those of Russia. So the Ukrainian and Russian language are very, very close. I believe mutually um, intelligible, kind of similar to like Italian and Spanish. And they also share, uh, yeah, once again, a very, very close history. Uh, Putin sees Ukraine, and I believe many Russians see Ukraine as sort of an outgrowth of Russia. So it makes more sense for them to be pressuring Ukraine to sort of join the fold. 
pressuring them to not join NATO, of course, is another huge difference that Ukraine is not a NATO country, whereas the Baltics are NATO countries. And so uh, to draw this comparison between uh, the two doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? That's, it does make sense that, once again, maybe that the U.S. might invade Afghanistan. You can, you can see how 20 years ago that sort of politically made sense to some people. It would just because they invaded Afghanistan does not mean they're going to invade Singapore, right? They're very, very different places. They have very different histories, very different relationships. Um, just because they're two different countries, I mean, it doesn't doesn't mean that that Russia is going to invade anywhere else. So that's the Russian threat. Let's talk about solvency. So solvency is important because if Khan can show that despite the threat, uh, despite the lack of any kind of status quo deterrence, putting more troops or changing whatever whatever defense commitment that NATO has won't actually change anything for Russia, uh, that can be really a deal breaker for the pro team. So pro needs to show that actually putting armor, putting troops there can actually stop something. So um, once again, these people whose names I can't pronounce, is this another picture I used twice? I'm so, this is the most embarrassing thing. I was making this in airports. I was super tired. I hadn't slept. You'll have to forgive me. Um, the couple says Russian invasion can be deterred by a strong NATO presence. Great. So if NATO ha did have a strong, especially a permanent presence in these states, it could deter Russia. Uh, Grady 17, this is a great card. U.S. armored brigades could prevent an invasion by Russia, not through symbolism, not through tripwire troops, but through actually uh, being able to fight off a uh, Russian invasion. They could actually, literally the armor, the troops themselves could uh, fight off a Russian invasion. And so these are two potential cards you could use, but there are um, others out there. Um, talking about about the solvency one more time, uh, we do have actually tripwire troops from NATO and the U.S. stationed in, um, in the Baltics. The idea of tripwire troops is that um, if any of these troops were to be injured or um, killed, that it would be easy enough to gain uh, the political will and especially the will of the people in order to fight back, to actually start some kind of a war, right? So um, there's this famous quote, I don't know by who, they, he says, like, how many U.S. troops do we need to prevent a war? The answer is one, right? Because if, let's say, we station one U.S. Uh, military member in Taiwan uh, and that military member is killed in a Chinese invasion, suddenly the U.S., has the incentive or at least the political will or the will of the people in order to go fight a war against China. So same thing in the Baltics. Uh, U.S. does have troops there, these tripwire troops, but put, they, they, they are not there in, in the numbers or with the equipment that's needed to uh, actually fight off an invasion uh, just to act as this sort of symbolism. So I believe when we look at this pro strategy that pro is um, favored in this topic. Uh, I think heavily, I think heavily favored, uh, which doesn't mean that Khan won't win some rounds, but I think this is certainly a pro biased topic. That's what everyone has said, and I don't think they're wrong. So your, your case should include, of course, some status quo that Russia might invade or will invade. Um, I don't think that it, it will rely solely on that status quo, right, to show the sort of Russian threat. Uh, and then we also need, of course, to show that we we can't right now repel a Russian threat. So we have many, many, many of those cards, uh, but also something that just talks about the threat of Russia. And then we'll go in uh, with a specific plan. And this will really be the bulk of the case will be how we actually go about increasing defense commitments. Uh, I have a few cards here talking about stationing air, air power away from the Baltics. I think this might be one of the best cases based on Clem 16, uh, because if we put air power in the Baltics themselves, first of all, it would be a very easy, they're very expensive, right? Air power like, uh, like F-16s are like extremely expensive, right? And so putting them right in the way of Russian, um, um, like the, the first wave of initial, of initial Russian invasion would be really dumb, right? Because Russia could take out the, this air power very quickly and we don't want to lose these valuable assets. So instead station them further back. Uh, there's four countries that Clem 16 gives, and this would also avoid a lot of the disadvantages to actually putting troops or armor in the Baltics themselves. So uh, I think you're going to sort of circumvent a lot of what uh, Khan's prepared for by using this uh, case based on Clem 16.
However, we just talked about U.S. armor brigades being helpful for fighting off Russian invasion, grade D-17. Um, that could be also the basis of your case. Or retooling the nuclear posture, Brands 19. Um, I think I personally might make a case focused on nuclear because I'm just obsessed with nuclear weapons, as many people are. Uh, so retooling the nuclear posture to better fend off a Russian invasion, or especially the Russian use, use of nukes, uh, could also be used. Finally, we want to have some kind of impact, right? If we don't... Um, if we don't increase defense commitments to the Baltics, if Russia does invade, what is the impact going to be? So you're going to blow the Khan team out of the water in terms of, of magnitude here, uh, triggering some kind of a nuclear war, which uh, or any kind of a war between NATO and Russia, of course, will be just, um, just disastrous, even if it's not non-nuclear. What you're maybe not going to win so much on is probability. I mean, the, the be, being able to show very, um, with a very high probability that an invasion is coming and that we need to put troops there and that these troops will deter Russia. This will be the difficult part. But um, like I said, I really think pro strength here is just that you can choose any kind of a plan, right? And the more wonky your plan for your plan is, the less likely Khan will be prepared for it in terms of rebuttals. And so here's a few I list that, but you can you can go through some of those other things we talked about, like uh, propaganda defense or um, or uh, misinformation or or uh, cyber defense, and if you can keep your topicality on these plans, I think you'll have a very, very high chance of winning a lot of rounds. That's for pro. Let's talk about con. So con's general ethos is something like, NATO is bothering Russia. It's not the other way around. Yes, Russia has built up troops. Yes, they've had exercises. Yes, they've had naval exercises with China. Why? Because of NATO. Because NATO keeps ra ratcheting up the pressure on Russia. And uh, Russia is simply one country by itself. Once again, fighting these other 30 nations. Like, this is um, not a small thing. Of course, Russia would be dumb to uh, not try its best to defend itself. Importantly, Russia has no real intention of invading the Baltics. They don't want the Baltics. There's no proof for that. And I really think Pro will have a very hard time coming up with any kind of real proof that Russia wants to invade the Baltics. It's ridiculous. And even if they were, Russia already takes NATO extremely seriously. I mean, NATO has uh, a nuclear umbrella from the US and other countries, and it's 30 countries that are willing to come to the aid of any of these one single countries if Russia were to invade. Crimea, for example, has incredible strategic significance and it's not a NATO member, right? And Russia has seen extreme blowback from this invasion. Hello, airplane. So Russia would be crazy to uh, pay a much, much, much higher price for a much le less strategic asset. Let's talk about status quo. So this is, once again, status quo from Khan's point of view. Uh, let's say the people in the Baltics are scared. Fine. They're scared. They're worried. That's fine, right? Baltic states have already taken large steps to increase their defense. Schmidt 17 goes over a bunch of these ways. Some really interesting things. I would really recommend reading this card. Um, they've increased military expenditure. They've increased training. They've even increased insurgent training for their troops. So the same way that... Um, Afghanistan has been able to, the Taliban in Afghanistan has been able to fight against the U.S. for 20 years. Um, some of the same tactics are being taught to the Baltic troops, so that if Russia were to occupy the Baltics, uh, there could be this um, insurgent movement with even training them how to, for example, set up IEDs um, and other things, so that there can be really a, a national um, uh, sort of fight against Russia even an, inv an invade and uh, an occupying Russia. Uh, civilian defense booklets have been handed out. I don't remember which country that is, but it's to teach citizens what to do in case of an invasion. I mean, there's just a lot of steps that they've taken. They've done definitely as much as they can, given that they're these small countries, right? But it's not just that they're small countries. They're actually... Um, NATO members, we've talked about this, and NATO itself has also taken steps since 2014, like we talked about uh, increasing the number of troops on rotation within these countries, um, 
So both the Baltics and NATO have taken large steps to increase their um, military presence and their military readiness for a Russian invasion. And so this really obviates any Khan evidence before 2014. Like any any evidence Khan has or pro has, I'm sorry, pro has before 2014 is really off the table because the world is a different place since then. Um, even if uh, we wanted to totally make these states impregnable, militarily the Baltics aren't defensible. That's Coffin 16. Um, there's no like rivers, mountains in the way between them and Russia. It's it's really just a clean shot to the capital for Russia, right? Once again, uh, we have a, as an earliest estimate that Russia could take all three capitals in two days, right? And so, what do you want to? If you put a large force there, you're going to slow that down to what a week to two weeks? Like what? Like would that be any better? The thing is, it doesn't matter because Russia, number one, as we said, doesn't want to take the Baltics, but number two, already takes NATO extremely seriously, given these tripwire troops with Kaufman 16 and the fact that these are NATO members, right? There's no way that Russia can chance a war with NATO. Um, yes, NATO would probably have more to lose than Russia, but it would be a suicidal for Russia. Lastly, uh, uh, the, this G021 card, it's not really a great source, but there's a lot of great material in it. Um, there are some other authors quoted. I think you might be able to not quote G0 and instead could, could quote one of these uh, people being interviewed. Um, but the card says that there's uh, many disincentives for Russian invasion. One of them is that an invasion would uh, drastically strengthen NATO. NATO already has started to sort of fall apart. There's many holes in the armor, like uh, Turkey, for example, buying... Uh, military equipment from Russia and getting closer to Russia. And so NATO is really falling apart. Russia would would be best to just let it fall apart rather than uh, some kind of event that could trigger a stronger NATO. All right, so we talked about tripwire troops. Let's answer this. So pro's answer will be that they don't work. Uh, quote Chamberlain 16, the NATO tripwire force will not deter Russia from advancing into the Baltics if it wishes to do so. Simply put, cheap force cannot signal high resolve. Threats fail when they are cheap to issue and not to execute, or and to execute, because cheap threats do not signal that the U.S. is highly re resolved to prevail over a stubbornly resistant opponent. And so the U.S. really needs to show, or that NATO really needs to show some real proof that they really intend to defend the Baltics, and that's by putting, um, putting a military presence there that is truly costly for the U.S. and for NATO, right? Otherwise, it's it's that that would be a real honest signal that they truly intend to defend the Baltics if they put a, a substantial military force there. Uh, but these uh, symbolic troops, they really mean nothing. Um, especially after this pullout from Afghanistan, does the U.S. does Biden uh, really, which makes up the sort of backbone of NATO, uh, do they really have the gut to fight a war, especially against a country that's more powerful than Afghanistan, one of the least powerful nations in the world. This is a, yeah, a real thought from the pro team. All right, let's talk about the disadvantages. So this is going to be, um, I believe the bulk of the con case will be just the disadvantages towards um, adding more uh, defense commitments. So first, the cost to actually defending the Baltics in a real way would be about $10 billion, two to $3 billion per year after that, plus 30,000 troops. I don't remember who's uh, who this is, but it's in the evidence pack linked below. Um, of course, opportunity costs. This is a really great card. I think you should include Hamilton 20 says that we should focus on the Black Sea and the Balkans. The cost card is not so good uh, because NATO is extremely wealthy, of course. Um, uh, but I do think it could be included just to kind of absorb some uh, pro rebuttals. But the opportunity cost card is good, right? Um, NATO uh, can defend against Russia. Russia is a threat to NATO, but not where we're looking at for this topic, right? And so to take our focus off of what's important, which is the Balkans, which is the Black Sea, is to make a major error. That's Hamilton 20. Uh, lastly... And you can feel free to use all of these advantages, right? You, uh, disadvantages. You can use five different disadvantages in your case. I don't think it'd be a bad idea. Um, it's just provocation. So Russia buildup um, has is spurred by NATO buildup. So the more that NATO puts 
um, troops, puts armor, puts missiles around Russia, the more Ro Russia is provoked to do exactly the same, and perhaps to take steps to defend its territory like um, invading other countries. That's maybe a big reason why uh, Russia has been putting so much pressure on the Ukraine, because uh, there's been some talk floating about including Ukraine as part of NATO. That's not what Russia wants. Russia does not want more NATO, it wants less NATO. And so if there is less NATO, Russia can also ease off the pressure. So yeah, these disadvantages, once again, will be crucial for Khan, but these this is not a, an exhaustive list of disadvantages. All right, um, NATO is bad. This, I think you'll certainly hear from at least a couple, a couple cases. Um, we could go so far just saying abolish NATO, right? N NATO it was is a is an old-fashioned, crystallized, um, weak uh, remnant of what it once was, right? It was maybe an important thing, at least from the NATO point of view, to repel the USSR during the Cold War. Now it serves no place in the world. In fact, NATO is simply a outstretch of the. Uh, U.S. hegemon, of the U.S. Uh, military, of U.S. colonialism. Uh, it's an expansionist, it's a destabilizing force, Clink 21. So NATO and Russia for a long time had sort of a long-standing agreement that NATO wouldn't continue to expand eastward. NATO has shattered that promise by, for example, including the Baltics. The Baltics are maybe the biggest insult that NATO um, has made to Russia. NATO wants more power. That's what NATO wants. It's not, uh, it's not for stabilizing the region. It's not for, for providing peace. It's for expanding the influence of uh, the U.S. and other member countries. In fact, Schwartz 21, it heightens tensions with Russia rather than protecting member states. In fact, in this way, it's a huge danger to member, member states. Quote, the formation of NATO helped intensify and institutionalize the Cold War. Perhaps uh, much of the travesties of the Cold War could have pre been prevented without NATO. And so if the if the Khan team wants to go so far and extreme as to say we should abolish NATO, of course they don't need to. They can just say NATO has a lot of disadvantages, they can't keep expanding, uh, they can't keep provoking Russia. Um, but abolishing NATO, here's some rebuttals to that. Uh, so obviously if there's like one uh, abolish NATO supporter, there's going to be 10 uh, NATO supporters. So... Yeah, you, there's plenty of literature on this. This is just one quote. The most catastrophic impact of NATO's retirement would be the risk of Russian aggression and miscalculation. Had they not joined NATO, the Baltic states would probably already be occupied by Russian troops. NATO's retirement would exacerbate divisions within Europe. Life without NATO would be more dangerous and less prosperous. In fact, uh, the Baltic states were uh, occupied by Russian troops for some time. Russia had a troop stationed there for quite a while, and it wasn't until, I don't know the year, but sometime fairly recently in the broad scope of history that uh, Russian troops actually left the Baltics. So, abolishing NATO, bad idea. Definitely have that... Um, have that card ready because you're going to hear that con case uh, at some point if you go to enough tournaments. Okay, uh, let's talk about con strategy generally. So honestly, I think the bulk of con's work has to be on rebuttals because pro just has uh, too many options. And you can have some general rebuttals, but if you have like one card, let's say for each of the uh, pro plans you can think of, maybe one or two cards as rebuttals, um, because if, if if pro runs one plan, and then you can shoot down that plan fairly effectively, con has a decent chance of winning, right? And the rest of it should just be simple cases. So we show there's no Russian threat we've already talked about, there's no, no threat of an invasion, there's no incentive to invade, in fact there's many disincentives to invade, uh, Russia has shown no aggression towards the Baltics, Baltics are different from Crimea, um, and in fact, putting more troops there are just going to um, escalate the situation. Uh, so yeah, so no Russian threat. It's not going to happen. The uh, uh, NATO and the Baltics have already prepared for an invasion. In any case, uh, Russia takes NATO very seriously. Just like hammer this on. There's there's nothing like the in the status quo. Everything's fine. Everything's peaceful. And then we'll start with the DAs, right? So you can use one strong DA or perhaps several DAs. I think the really strong DA will be provoking Russia. I think that will be the the major um, DA, and you can link to 
Um, of course, the increased chance of military conflict as an impact, but also potential economic impacts, maybe even uh, other impacts I'm not thinking of. Um, but these other DAs can be helpful, right? So we already talked about a couple of these. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe some kind of NATO DA. Uh, the cost throw in there if you're using a bunch anyway, it's the weakest of all of them. Um, opportunity cost, if you want to learn a lot about the Black Sea and Balkans, and you can really show that NATO, NATO cannot effectively spread its focus um, across two, that would be a very decent case, but I believe it would take a good amount of research. Um, and yeah, like I said, provocation, that's going to be probably the most popular DA that people will use because it's probably the strongest one. Um, so yeah, con focus on a simple case, um, hammering in at least a minute, maybe two minutes on case for no Russian threat, uh, followed by one strong DA like Russian provocation or several uh, weaker DAs. Um, and then, as I said, a lot of your prep time should really be focused on rebuttals. Uh, we have in our evidence pack from Debate Track some rebuttals. We have some blocks. We don't have a ton, certainly not on all of the things you're going to see in a tournament. So, uh, yeah, if you can work on that, if you can work on work on it with uh, your team, with your class, with your partner, uh, that will be extremely effective. Or if you can cobble together some other briefs with better blocks, that could be uh, put you in a really good place for defense on con. All right. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. I really appreciate everyone who watches these videos. Um, I love all of your comments. Like, really, the comments themselves are the lifeblood of this channel. Uh, that is all that really makes a difference for me. Um, if you enjoyed this video or if you enjoyed Debate Track, please consider signing up for a trial of our uh public forum course so we have in a complete public forum course in 10 chapters video lectures exercises some of it's even audited if you want that um and we have a free trial of it so it would really mean a lot for me if you could sign up for that free trial take a look at the course see what you think of it and if you think it could be helpful um then uh go ahead and buy a copy that's of course what i want there's a link available in the description below um i think if you're new at public forum or uh, better yet, new at debate generally, this will be a game changer for your future debate career. So, um, consider that. Thanks for watching once again. Enjoy these next couple months, and I will see you for the next topic. Adios.